Hey, everyone. If you love this podcast, can you do me a big favor and please give us a review on whatever platform you're using and tell a friend or family member to subscribe. And speaking of subscribing, that's the best way to keep up because you'll get a notification each time we upload a new episode. So make sure you hit subscribe on whatever platform you're now using. Finally, if you're feeling generous, appreciative, or perhaps a bit guilty for getting all this free content, haha, go to patreon.com forward slash the Suzanne Banker show and become a member. You'll get free ebooks, early access to the episodes, and a chance to win the occasional free 30 minute coaching session with yours truly. From the magnificent Midwest, it's The Suzanne Venker Show, where men and women are equal in value but wildly different by nature. Join us here every week as we challenge the culture's hugely flawed narratives about men, women, sex, and love. From coast to coast and from around the world, thank you for joining us. So a quick announcement that I plan to have a monthly parenting series on this podcast going forward. And when possible, my husband, Bill, is going to join us, which I'm super excited about. Today, unfortunately, is not one of those times because I didn't plan for this to be a parenting episode per se. However, it could very much be viewed as one, since I know there are a lot of parents who don't want their kids to live with a boyfriend or a girlfriend they're not at least engaged to. And don't feel like they have a way to make this argument in a manner that will resonate with their kids. The one exception to this, of course, is very religious parents. Those kids have been raised to associate sex exclusively with marriage. And while their kids can certainly disagree with their parents' belief, many of them do agree. And so the conversation about shacking up would likely not even come up because these kids know their parents' position on it. But there are millions of parents who fall somewhere in between being religious, let's say, and being, I don't know, agnostic or atheist or something, meaning there's millions of families who are not not religious, but they're also not steeped in it to the point where, you know, they, they take that hard line. And so these are the folks I'm talking about. These are parents who need a secular case against shacking up since doing so has become so normalized in our culture that nobody even thinks twice about it. And plenty of parents have, and which isn't to say that all parents are care one way or the other, with whether their kids do that. Some of them think it's perfectly fine or that it's even a good idea. They might have encouraged them to do it. This isn't for them. This is specifically an episode for those parents who feel like, you know, that's, that's really not a good idea. Um, and they can't use the hard line that a religious family can like, well, you just, you just don't do that until you get married. Um, you have to have a more nuanced, um, well-argued reason to convince your kids that that's not a good idea when you're living in a culture that promotes it so wholeheartedly. That's, that's the group I'm talking about. So if you fall into this, this is the episode, this is an episode for you because you're going to want to, you're going to need this and you're going to use this, be able to use this in uh, helping to helping your kids understand why this is a bad idea, because it does seem so logical. You know, the common, there are several common reasons for why cohabitation has skyrocketed. I mean, yes, we're also poo-pooing marriage or or putting it on the back burner. And so that has a lot to do with it, but also the argument that, oh, you're going to know each other better. You're going to get to learn about um, whether or not it would work long-term, which is a bogus thing, which we're going to get to, and, or it's just more convenient financially to do this. And so there, those are, and you know, like you were already there anyway, sleeping over at each other's houses. So this just, you just sort of fell into it. And there's not a lot of pushback for that when that happens, there's, there's certainly not from your friends, definitely not from the culture and very often not from parents. They just kind of take a hands-off approach to that. Um, and, and so, uh, yeah, this is, this is, this is the group I'm talking about. Um, I'm going to begin by playing a recent recording from a young female caller to the Drake, to the Dave Ramsey show. So let's listen into that. Hi, 
thank you so much for taking my call. You bet. Um, my main question is if my boyfriend and I should split rent 50-50 or by percentage of income in the future. Mm. Say what? Are y'all are y'all moving in together? Um, so we've been discussing living together in the future. I'm 22, he's 23. Um, he just graduated from college last year and he's making 79 right now. I'll be done this year with uh, making 65K. And I said I would prefer to be engaged before moving in together. And we're both lucky enough that our parents are fine with us staying home, saving up money, doing the baby steps. Mm -hmm. But he wants to get a town home in a year and a half from now and wants me to move in with him and says he intends to marry me and that he proposed before two years if we get along living together. I would say Yikes. if you were my sister or my daughter or my good friend, I would say mm -hmm. he is out of his mind. I would. <laughs> okay. So needless to say, if you've been listening to this podcast for a while, you know that I'm an avid Dave Ramsey listener and, um, Mostly that's because these call-ins are so applicable to the kind of things that I deal with with coaching as well. It's really not, it's supposed to be a money podcast, but it's very relationship oriented as well. So that, that caller um, reminded me actually of my own story once upon a time when I was 22. Yeah. Did she say she was 22? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I graduated from college and um, was, had a boyfriend of four years. We were together the whole time. And um, he was a couple years older than I was. And he wanted me, after I'd graduated, to move in with him. Um, and I said, no, essentially, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Um, mostly because, well, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have done it anyway, but he lived in one part of the country, I lived in another. And for me to do that with no guarantee of the future made zero sense to me. Um, and my feeling was you either know, or you don't know, or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. granted we were young, but we didn't have the ability to really be together in the same vicinity, um, while waiting a few years. So it would have meant, you know, separate cities, which is not, which back then is not the way it is today where people are far more connected and seem to, sometimes make things work long distance, but back then you just, that would have been really the end of the relationship. Um, but my point is that there are really two different ways of approaching the whole cohabitation, living with someone before you're, before you know whether or not you're going to spend your life with them. And one of one mindset is like I said earlier, it's just either testing it or it's easier and more convenient. And there's really not a lot of other thought that goes into it. And then there's people who think really more long-term and think beyond tomorrow and next year. And I think that's really what this comes down to with, with when you're dealing with living with someone. I mean, as a relationship coach, you can imagine how many times I've come across women who are either living with their boyfriend or who have lived with a boyfriend in the past. It's a lot. And they regret it like hands down almost every time, unless they ended up together, which actually I don't think I've had that many couples who did live together a few, maybe um, before getting married, maybe after they were engaged, but not like years of being together and then deciding later to, to get married. Um, and then coincidentally, just the other day, I showed one of our rental properties to a prospective tenant who just moved to town from a different area of the country after she and her boyfriend, with whom she'd been living, broke up. And apparently her roommate just broke up with her boyfriend, too, and they'd been living together for five years. So this is this clearly very, very common practice does not end well. And why learn this after the fact? right? This is complete madness. You don't need to go down this route and lose this many years of your life, wasting time trying to determine whether or not a relationship is going to work. You should know that before you ever are living in the same house with someone. 
I'm honestly just moving in with a guy before your future together. And I mean, I would say this to men or women, but I I'm calling women to the carpet here because I think men will more often than not. Um, well, I don't know. I can't say they instigate it more. I think that's probably pretty equal, but I guess what I'm trying to say is if, if someone's going to stop it or put a stop to it or say, no, it's going to be the woman. It's just, that's how it's going to go down. And so that's why I'm focusing on women moving in with a guy before your future together has been established is just dumb. It does not, it is not a step up in your relationship. If anything, it's a step back. I I honestly can't get over how easy it was to successfully sell this whole cohabit this whole cohabitation idea to an entire generation of otherwise very smart women. Although honestly, I don't I don't blame women because I I actually blame their parents and their mentors and all the women who came before them who sold them a bill a good bill of goods by suggesting this was a good thing. Here's why. Not moving in with anyone for whom your future has not been established is a really bad idea. Number one, living with a man with whom your future is unclear will cost you years of your life if the relationship doesn't work out. I can't stress this one enough because these are the women I hear from. These are, these are the folks I'm having coaching coaching sessions with at least in part so so many of these women end up exchanging access to things that should be only within the confines of a commitment so that these don't think these things don't become um negotiable later on so you're so in other words having doing half the household chores and having access to sex with no exchange for security is never going to be something that a woman wants. It might work for a man because his needs are different. He's not going to be looking for security in the same way that a woman is. So since that's what women ultimately want, they go along for years, um, seemingly okay right? Things feel pretty equal for a while, but eventually they always want to know what they, women always want to know where the relationship is going. And that's because ultimately it's going to, these years are going to bump up against her biological clock and it's going to start ticking louder and louder. And it's at this point, the relationship is going to have to be reevaluated if there has been no commitment, if there has been no ring and a date, if you're not engaged, if there's no understanding or date, you know, to get married. Um, you don't know, you just don't know. And that, and not knowing, um, is always going to be a very insecure feeling that you're going to always run up against a wall at some point where you're going to have to have an answer to that. And you don't want to bring a man to the table. You, you don't want to put yourself in that boat. You want a man who knows from the get-go before you ever share space with him that you're it. You are it. And a man knows when he's got the one that he wants wants forever. The whole, um, I mean, nobody wants to be with someone who doesn't know whether or not he wants to be with you. And I know this can go both ways. Um, you know, that, a, that a man could want to live with a woman and the woman has no problem with it and apparently has no problem with it. And, um, she really is the one who's dragging her heels or whatever that, that does, that does happen. But typically speaking, um, it's the other way around and either which way it's just bad news. It costs you years of your life. If it doesn't work out, that's the bottom line. And, it was unnecessary. There was no reason to do that. You could, um, determine it's much easier to disengage from a relationship when you're not living together than it is once you have made that move. Number two, it's not going to help determine whether or not you're compatible. That's just a lie. If you date someone long enough, you're going to know if you're compatible. 
And then the flip side of that is that the truth is marriage is a very long business. Years, years of your life. And there's no way to know in advance or figure out in advance if everything, if you're compatible in every way. Whether or not it lasts depends entirely on your marriage mindset or your attitude and your level of commitment. I remember my mother used to say, things just come out years later. (laughs) And it's true. It is so true. Those of us who've been married for eons know that there are things you are still learning about your spouse that you didn't know. And things do come out later that you hadn't seen. There's no way to overturn every stone and figure that out in in advance. And so living with the person isn't going to do that. None of us really ever knows a person entirely until decades later. That's just the reality of it. Um, So what young people are really saying when they're making this argument about trying to determine if you're compatible is that they're scared. Understandably so, because they are, many of them often products of divorce and they don't want to fail the way their parents did. And they think cohabiting cohabiting will ensure their success. They believe that. So it's like if they're going into it with, you know, good reason or not, sorry, not good reason with good intentions. That's the, that's the word I meant. And their parents, many of whom are divorced themselves think that might be a good idea. And so they encourage it as well. It is not going to ensure your success. There's absolutely nothing good, nothing that will come of that to prove or solidify anything in your mind. It just just doesn't work that way. That'd be nice if, if it did, but it doesn't. Number three, cohabitation is not a step towards marriage. No woman should be honored by the prospect of moving in with her boyfriend. Like this is a step up in my relationship. It is not a step up. It's a step back. It's not an honor. It's an insult. It says, you know, I'm really not sure about you yet, but let's give it a go. And this is a major red flag because as I said, men, when they know, they know. They have no problem jumping in when they know they found the right woman. They will have a ring and they will ask you. And so you're taking, you're you're lowering your standards for making sure he knows before you take that step by just acquiescing to something that's a lesser state than you should accept. You know, it's sad because the research shows that most Americans today say that cohabitation is acceptable. And I think that's so shocking and it's such a testament to how easy it is to really change attitudes when the pressure is strong enough. And, you know, I honestly think when, Americans say this, they say they're referring to the sex thing, you know, because it used to be that you just didn't live with a partner. You just would never consider that because sex is for marriage. I mean, that's many decades ago, but I mean, that was the original thought process behind it is, you know, you get married and then you make babies, right? And then you have sex. And so this whole turnaround in having it be acceptable, I think what people mean is, well, the sex before marriage thing is gone. So what's the big deal? And so they're not, and I agree that that's not going to be a strong argument against living together is because you don't have sex. And that, that you have to be more practical in your approach to young people who've grown up in a culture whose values are so different from what we grew up with. You have to come at it from a, um, a, a different place to make your arguments, which is why I've called this episode the secular case against shacking up, because I want to give young people, but then also parents of young people those practical reasons why it's a bad idea that don't have anything to do with sex or religion or any of those things that we typically think are um, the reasons not to. I think that's, I think these arguments are very much lacking. So I hope that this is helpful. Um, Happy to hear from anybody who wants to ask me specifically about this. Um, and I can answer in, in a later episode or, um, yeah, come back to it next week because this is a topic dear to my heart. And I just think there is not enough, um, not any really, um, message out there about, about why this is a bad idea, um, from my secular point of view. And that ends this hour of the Suzanne Venker show.
Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast and to leave us a review as well as share this episode with a friend. As always, you may reach me with any questions or comments at Suzanne at the Suzanne show.com. And if you would like to support this podcast, which would be very much appreciated, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash the Suzanne Banker show. Thanks everyone. Have a good week.